What effects have Uber and Lyft had on our society? This is super interesting. This is the effects, as you can see, of Uber and Lyft in US cities. Jumping down here, the series summarizes key findings and recommendations from a compilation of studies conducted by Jeremy Michalek, the lead author, and other Carnegie Mellon University College of Engineering researchers. Going down here, the researchers found that TNCs, and side note, TNC means Transportation Network Company. You could just replace TNC with Uber and Lyft just to make it a bit easier. So the researchers found that TNCs have increased increased economic growth, employment, and wages for intermittent jobs in U.S. cities. However, which is really interesting as a starting point, they are not a reliable way to reduce car ownership, meaning that when Uber and Lyft, let's say, get to a city, it doesn't make people feel the need to not have a car. When TNCs entered U.S. cities, car ownership actually increased in car-dependent and slow-growth cities, and TNCs displaced transit ridership most in cities with high income and fewer children. Overall, Uber and Lyft affect different kinds of cities differently. I've talked about this a lot throughout this channel. Your location has a big impact on how much money you can make, the overall climate of Uber and Lyft, and a lot more. The second thing they talked about is traffic and the environmental impact. Summing it up, they can clean the air, but clog the streets. Taking an Uber or Lyft ride instead of a personal vehicle can reduce air pollution costs by nine to 13 cents but the extra driving to and from passengers increases other costs from congestion, crash risk, and climate change by about 45 cents. You create lower external costs to society when you drive your own personal vehicle compared to taking an Uber and a Lyft. Should governments encourage shared rides through TNC ride pooling like Lyft share and Uber X share? Is ride pooling worth it to really get out there and encourage? We found that policies in Chicago, so keep in mind this is in Chicago, intended to increase ride pooling actually worked. However, while pooling can substantially reduce traffic costs, private incentives already encourage pooling at levels that are fairly efficient for society, so imposing much higher pooling rates may come at a cost. Next, they did talk about the idea of electric vehicles. This is something that's still very ongoing. I know a lot of cities, some states, you know, different countries are trying to work a lot towards being like environmentally conscientious and being, let's say, electric only by a given date. They did talk about how by having electric vehicles, they reduce air emission costs by about 10% in New York City and 22% here in LA. However, I think flexibility is important. Again, the technology is still so new. The researchers found that the best fleet is typically a mix of electric and gas powered vehicles. To me, that just makes sense. I still feel like we're super far away. That, I know I might get some hate for this, but that's why for me, I do like Priuses. I used to have one, you know, now I don't. But I do like Priuses because I feel like they're the best of both worlds of being a dual electric and gas powered vehicle. I think it's a good kind of like halfway step to like say getting a Tesla or a fully only electric vehicle. And they did examine, which I think is kind of interesting as a random kind of last point, the capacity for Uber and Lyft to reveal and potentially address social inequities. In one of the studies, the researchers examined TNC ridership during the heat waves in New York in 2019. They found that ridership increased more in high income neighborhoods than low income neighborhoods, suggesting that low income riders are subject to endure more extreme heat and humidity. I actually kind of disagree with this main point in terms of enduring extreme heat or whatever. I don't think that's the case. It just makes sense that if you have a ton of money, like an insane amount of money, getting an Uber or Lyft to you, probably you don't even think about it in terms of the financial impact. However, if obviously money is a bit tight, Getting an Uber just because it's hot out, you might be like, eh, it's hot, but I am sober, right? Like I'm not drinking or anything. I don't have to take the Uber. I could take the bus or the Metro instead. I have to kind of watch my money. Why do that? In my opinion, it's kind of that mentality where do you have to take an Uber Lyft or do you want to take an Uber Lyft? Which brings me to this next page I want to go here, all about the fact that Uber and Lyft are reducing drunk driving crashes. Like in my opinion, when it comes to Uber and Lyft, one of the biggest benefits honestly is their impact on drunk driving and everything. It's interesting though, the, the studies and the research is kind of interesting. Going down here, as you can see, ride sharing often wins against taxis and public transit. I remember back in Boston, this is before Uber and Lyft were a thing, getting a taxi at night was a nightmare. I'm talking, it could take us, and I'm not exaggerating, an hour to two just to get home because of how clogged it was to get a taxi. I mean, it was insane. And we'd have to do that thing where you're like, okay, do I want to leave the bar at one, which is super early, but I get home pretty easily. 
or do I leave at two and it's a nightmare to get back? When a person considers driving after drinking, adding ride sharing to their available transportation options could be the difference between choosing to drive or choosing to get a ride. Like I said before, you know, when it comes to that low income versus high income situation regarding heat, with something like heat, you don't have to take an Uber or Lyft. It's more of a nice benefit to be able to do so. However, with this, you absolutely do not want to be drinking and driving. Of course, we all know that. Looking at 20 studies that examined ride sharing of those, 17 studies or 85% linked ride sharing to a lower level of alcohol impaired driving and alcohol related crashes, which is huge. However, the researcher Morrison said that the benefits are likely to differ from place to place. This is kind of interesting that ride sharing will reduce drunk driving and crashing in some places, but not others. Furthermore, and this is kind of like a whole other side of the coin, ride sharing appears to have important costs too. In places where ride sharing is available, there seems to be an increase in alcohol consumption, assaults, pedestrian crashes, traffic congestion, and air pollution. So it's important to weigh any benefits of ride sharing against these possible costs or negative aspects. This is all super interesting to me. And I was thinking about this before the video. I don't know if I can think of any, at least in like modern day times, any other like industry that kind of came about out of nowhere and has been literally taking over the world. I know that sounds like a very bold and very big statement, but I mean, think about it. Like ride sharing 10 years ago wasn't even a phrase. It wasn't even a term. No one talked about Uber or Lyft. No one thought about getting in a stranger's car. And I still remember the first time I took a Lyft. Uh, I took a Lyft before an Uber. It was in 2014. That was eight years ago at the exact time in this video. And it's crazy that in eight years, ride sharing is now a full fledged industry. Whether you have a ton of money or not, ride sharing is something that's an accessible option for a lot of people. Let's say if they do want to take it, whether it is a situation that you, let's say, don't have a car, whether, let's say, you've been drinking and you want to be safe and responsible, let's say, just for whatever reason, you need to get from point A to point B and you're not able to drive. Let's say public transportation is not really an available thing in your area. Boom. Uber and Lyft is a great option. It's insane how much Uber and Lyft is taking over. And one thing I've always been kind of very curious about is, well, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Now, from my perspective, I think it's a good thing. I think especially when you involve Friday and Saturday nights going out for me, I always take Ubers and Lyfts to be as safe as possible. There are a lot of benefits to Uber and Lyft. However, it's far from perfect. It is really interesting, you know, talking about these articles that one, when it comes to car ownership, I feel like that does makes sense you know i know they were talking about how they were curious if like say uber and lyft goes to a city do people tend to not want to buy a car or does car ownership go down because you're like hey well i don't need to drive i can just take an uber and lyft it does make sense that i feel like again for me you know i have a car but i also take ubers and lyfts i know that's a case for a lot of people as well so to me that makes sense that car ownership doesn't necessarily decrease the whole traffic aspect i think does make some sense as well that maybe traffic has increased as a result of Ubers and Lyfts being pretty much anywhere, a lot of drivers being on the road. In addition, one thing they did not talk about is kind of the explosion of delivery driving. I mean, 10 years ago, if you were to order food, it's really just, I don't know, maybe at least here in America, Chinese and maybe pizza. I feel like the only thing I ever ordered was either Chinese food or pizza. I feel like those are kind of two, maybe there's a couple other ones, but delivery driving is not what it is now. And I feel like that is another huge congestion. I guarantee if you factor in Uber Eats, the traffic aspects probably skyrocket because there's now more riders on the road doing delivery driving, whether it is a mom and pop sandwich shop to a gigantic restaurant. On the last point though, it is very interesting that although yes, ride sharing has helped a lot when it comes to drunk driving, you know, DUIs, uh, drunk accidents when driving and everything. That's good, but there is also that negative aspect and it is a very kind of unique thing to bring up. And it reminds me of that quote that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. As they said, if Uber and Lyft goes to a city, there is some research to show that alcohol consumption increases, assaults increase, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it is that perspective that let's say on a Friday night, someone's like, okay, let's say Uber and Lyft did not exist. Getting a taxi, a nightmare. Having a get around can be very, very tricky. So they're like, you know what? I'll just go out. If I'm going to be driving, I'm going to have maybe one drink. That's it. I'm going to be safe and responsible because that's what I'm going to do. However, with Uber and Lyft, people feel like, well, I can drink as much as I want. I can get an Uber or a Lyft that's, let's say, only 10 or 15 bucks to go somewhere, to go to a bar, a club, wherever I want to go. 
So it kind of gives people the freedom, good or bad, and flexibility, again, good or bad, to pretty much go as crazy as they want and make sense. Alcohol, when you look at all the factors, you know, not only just the health aspect, but like they said, assaults, it makes sense. If, let's say, you feel like you can get as drunk as you want and order an Uber or Lyft and just be safe because of that Uber or Lyft, it makes sense that maybe with people drinking a lot more, certain negative things happen as a result of the increased alcohol consumption. I think it was last year or two years ago, there was like a big viral video on TikTok. I remember that some girl said, if we're not gonna black out, then why do we Uber? If we are not gonna black out, why the f did we Uber? And I think that is like a lot of people's perspective that they're like, well, we can get there safely to and from the location. We don't have to worry about driving. We can be as safe as possible. So let's go crazy. And it is tough to say, you know, because it is that situation, like I said, the road to hell is paved with good intentions that, well, yes, drunk driving has been decreasing, DUIs and everything. Because a lot of people say now, well, look, why drive when you can literally just get a Lyft or an Uber? Like, it doesn't make sense. It takes two seconds to get a Lyft and Uber. The ease of it is amazing. And of course, the price way cheaper than taxis and other options that you have just the whole aspect to it but at the same time that gives people the freedom to kind of go a bit crazier maybe than they would typically it is really tricky and i think with ride sharing just kind of coming almost out of nowhere let's be honest i mean again when i first took it in 2014 i think in the next year or two it almost seemed like it was everywhere like ride sharing exploded way faster than ever before maybe even i almost look at it kind of maybe similar to tinder as well that the whole idea of swiping right and swiping left was never a thing and then a year after tinder now that's a very common almost slang phrase people use i've even heard people being out in public being like oh yo swipe right as in like i find them attractive or swipe left i don't find them attractive it is just super interesting seeing the massive impact uber and lyft has had on our society it is a very bittersweet thing though there are a tremendous amount of benefits to uber and lyft and we all know that but there's also a lot of cons and i think as a lot more research comes out again i still think it's so new you know as comfortable as a lot of people are with ubers and lyfts it is still a very new thing and i think just trying to figure out is this good is this bad what effects is it having on society in both positive and negative ways there's a lot of mixed research and so far a lot of it has been good some bad it is really tough to say so i guess we'll see what happens in the future